talked immediately at birth. It said when, he, when the father came, he was quiet because it would make his father nervous if he was talking right away. Mother didn't mind, but the father was nervous. <laughs> Some funny things in Buddhism. Okay, you guys, are, anybody new here who wasn't here in the previous two days or any of the two days? Or two or three new people? Okay. Okay, everybody else here, here before? So wh what did we talk about last time? <laughs> we were, we sort of finished a little bit with Vijnanavada, I think. And, uh, you know, the mind-only school, or it's what they call the mind-only school. I apologize for this. It looks like I'm swigging something. <laughs> they didn't bring big glass. It's just Pellegrino. Pilgrim's water. So uh, <clears throat> we were talking about that. And we were following a sangha. And we skipped, of course, in the summary that you have, all the many other works of a sangha. A sangha was a really brilliant teacher. Uh, his mother was a nun who decided that Buddhism was in a bad state in her time. And she wanted to uh, improve the state, so she resigned as a nun. And then she married first a Brahmin. No, first, I think, first a Kshatriya, um, a warrior class person, and produced a Sangha as a son. And then I don't know what went wrong, but then she remarried again a Brahmin and produced Vasubandhu, his two brothers. And originally, Vasubandhu was an individual vehicle teacher, you know, Theravada type teacher. And uh, then he, and a Sangha was originally a Mahayana teacher. And finally, the younger brother had to listen to the older brother, and the older brother said, look, you, he gave him all his own writings, and he gave him a bunch of sutras. And he said that you should read these, and if you still want to be individual vehicle person, you do. But if you like the Mahayana, then you can be Mahayana. So then the Sangha, apparently, I mean, the Bandhu had this huge pile. And he said, oh, my God, when I agreed for my older brother to read these books, I didn't realize he would send over a bullock cart full of books. Because the Sangha had written a great many books. And then he had a great many of these huge Mahayana sutras. And so he then it is said he, in order to read them without getting too nervous and too tired, he had a, a bathtub filled with, because he was already a very famous teacher and he was therefore well taken care of. He had a bathtub filled with sesame oil. And he sat in the sesame oil, warm sesame oil, and while reading the sutras and the, and the shastras, the wonderful books written by a sangha. And then it is said that uh, there was a parrot who was in his room. And that parrot was reborn as a great pundit. <laughs> Having listened to what's about to read all these amazing things, it is said. So anyway, the, the, but I think we discussed it the last time, also this issue of interpretable meaning and definitive meaning. And in the, in the elucidation of the intention sutra, the Samdhita Mochana Sutra, uh, on the page six of this handout uh, in English, it says that, first of all, quoting that, it says, first of all, the Lord in the deer park at Rishipatana and Varanasi for the sake of those involved in the disciple vehicle, that's what I call individual vehicle, because it's a vehicle for an individual to attain nirvana, turned a wondrous, amazing wheel of dharma such as had never before been turned in the world by humans or gods, by showing the different 16 different aspects of the four noble or holy truths. Nevertheless, even that wheel of dharma turned by the Lord was surpassable, provisory, interpretable in meaning, and disputable. Because, well, he doesn't say it here, but because that wheel emphasized the existence of all things. It emphasized, or it, it left intact in people's minds that he was talking about things that he considered to be existent the way they did. And the way that the, un, the common person, the ignorant person, thinks things exist is as if they were, they had intrinsic reality, as if they had intrinsic essence. 
people sometimes say as if they had essence, but that's not enough because everything, you know, things do have essences. You know, you can boil some, some uh, oranges and you get the essence of orange. But intrinsic essence means an essence that is essential to the thing comes out of the thing itself. And the thing, in a way, comes out of the essence. So intrinsic reality or intrinsic substance, intrinsic objectivity, intrinsic identity. So in the first thing, in the first wheel of the Dharma, the Buddha didn't challenge that. He talked about what people think is their real suffering and what people look, hope for, which is their real release from suffering. So it's called the wheel of Dharma of things being real. And that makes it, what he says here, surpassable, provisory, interpretable in meaning, and disputable. So you can argue with that. Then the Lord, for the sake of those involved in the universal vehicle, and called universal because these are beings who, the people on that vehicle are, want to take everybody with them, the universal society with them, to freedom and enlightenment, not just themselves as individuals, because it, somehow they have the insight of their interconnectedness with all the people ahead of time, even before they have attained some kind of enlightenment. And so he says, for the sake of those involved in the universal vehicle, Turn to second wheel of Dharma, and this is Prajnaparamita, or Transcendent Wisdom Sutras, even more wondrous and amazing by proclaiming emptiness, starting from the fact of the unreality, the productionlessness or unproducedness, ceaselessness, primordial peace, and natural liberation of all things, that things are naturally in nirvana already, in other words. Nevertheless, according to this sutra, which is also spoken by Buddha, according to Buddhists, even this wheel of Dharma was surpassable, provisory, interpretable, and disputable. So it's sort of the opposite in the way that the, the, the something the Mochana is considering. It's the opposite of everything is real. This one is everything is unreal, sort of emphasizing the unreality of things to help people overcome that intrinsic reality habit or self-habit or um, essence, you know, intrinsic essence habit, intrinsic identity habit, in order to help people overcome that, and uh, emphasizing the unreality of everything. Uh, but as I think we discussed last time, I did discuss right when I did the thing about the nose, when we talked about the nose, that the unreality has to do with the fact that when you try to pin down something that you think is real, it will dissolve under analysis if you keep analyzing it with strong enough analysis which actually science did in, our modern science did in, in 1926 conclusively, according to some great, some of the greatest of the quantum people. The, the, the rebellion, then, then Einstein was not among them and he rebelled against that, so scientists still don't, haven't woken up to that. But everything did dissolve under analysis in 1926 as far as Heisenberg and Niels Bohr and other quantum people. So, so, um, so in that sense, everything is unproduced, et cetera, all this kind of thing. And the li natural liberation of all things, meaning they're all nirvana, but of course nirvana as a separate thing dissolves under analysis too. But somehow, that it, it, when that experience of everything disappearing, dissolving under analysis, and the disappearance also disappearing, then leads to this natural liberation, primordial liberation of all things. So that we'll come back to discussing that <laughs> rather puzzling point. <coughs> Nevertheless, even this wheel of Dharma was surpassable, provisory, interminable, and disputable, according to this sutra. Then, which is Buddha himself speaking according to Buddhas. So he's now saying that his prajnaparamita, which in other cases he says is the highest and the ultimate and blah, blah, blah. He says now it's only interpretable in this context, in this sutra, he says. Then the Lord, for the sake of those involved in all vehicles, both individual vehicle and universal vehicle. And the individual, they say all instead of just two because the individual one is broken into two, the disciple vehicle and the hermit Buddha vehicle, you know, who is not a disciple who follows their own way in the woods. They're sort of hermit, what you might call hermit Buddha. Turn the third wheel of the Dharma using the finest discrimination starting from the fact of the unreality, productionlessness, productionlessness, ceaselessness, primordial peace, and natural liberation of all things, he turned that wheel, but he then qualified his statement of the unreality. In other words, it's sort of like the Prajnaparamita with a qualification using fine discrimination. 
saying that some things are unreal and unproduced and ceaseless and primordial peace and natural, but some things maybe not. In other words, he qualified that, which we discussed last time, I think, where he said that things as conceived conceptually, things as in the imagined reality, the, the three levels of reality, imagined, relative, ineffable relative, that is, and then perfected or absolute, and so all of his things about everything is unreal is because the ignorant ordinary person is thinking things really are what they imagine them to be, that is, whatever they have a concept for them as, right? And according to that, they're unreal because they're not, they don't correspond to your concepts. It's what, he, it's what is, the, is the message delivered in, that, in, the, in this third type of sutra, which main, when, one of which is the Samdhini Mochana, the elucidation of the intention sutra. That's the main one. That's the leader one. But then there are others, the uh, um, Sri Mala uh, Devi, Simhanada Sutra, the lion's roar of the glorious uh, goddess Sri Mala, who's a little girl, actually, who has an insight about ultimate reality as a child and talks about the Buddha nature and things like that. Famous Buddha nature sutra, it's called also. So, so, so in a way, this theory of interpretable and definitive, which is considered really important about how to understand the Buddha's teaching, so that you won't meditate on the wrong teaching and, and, and reach the wrong experience or misinterpret the experiences that you reach. Um, this is a sutra that gives, a, and of course there's a lot more things in this sutra than this, but this just re encourages people following the teachings given in this sutra by saying this sutra is the most definitive one. So if you, there's something that seems to contradict this sutra from the early one, which is really the province more of the individual vehicle, the real nirvana, the real samsara, dualistic Buddhism, you could say. If I seem to be contradicting that, which he does in that sutra by talking about natural primal liberation. And then if I seem to be contradicting the middle wheel of Dharma sutras like Prajnaparamita, transcendent wisdom, where I said that everything is unreal, everything is, is illusory, everything is like that, then you have to understand that as being qualified, that this I meant only everything as you conceive it and conceptualize it. And that there is a relative that around here, this interconnectedness that is real, if you follow me. And in that third wheel, and then and that's the real, that's his real teaching because he's discriminating between what is unreal and what is real. He's saying something is real, something is unreal, in other words, right? And the second one seems to put everything blanket, blanket sort of um, um, critique that everything is unreal, everything is lacks intrinsic reality, and so forth. You get it? It's illogical, and, and it connects also historically because they're sort of saying, well, first Buddha taught to the people who were too much into, uh, who were very much into reality, but who were suffering a lot and who wanted to think there was a place to escape from. But he couldn't challenge their realism, their naive realism too strongly. Because if you tell them when their hand is on fire that that burning is, is unreal, that burning pain is unreal, and, and uh, it's an illusion, they're going to like to heck with you. <laughs> I want to put out this burning sensation, you know. It's very, very real to me. I can't, I can't, it's, it's ridiculous, it's cruel. You're dismissing my suffering as irrelevant by saying it's unreal because it's totally real to me. So, so that's the first one. He taught them then, yes, okay, your burning is real, but you can escape from that burning. And in Nirvana, there's no burning. And then the second one is for people who are too much into that duality, of the real nirvana and the real world of suffering. And then he teaches that it's all unreal on an ultimate level, but it's all relatively real in this less real, but still real, sort of unreally real <laughs> level. And uh, therefore you can, and when you understand that, then you will find out that even this, this here is, you are already free of suffering. Uh, you will find that out. And so he taught that for those who were too attached to the reality of samsara and nirvana. He taught the non-duality of it and everything. And that was really great. It was better than the first one, deeper, transcendent wisdom. But the third one where he discriminates and he doesn't make it such a blanket critique of unreality, that's the really great one. 
He leaves people on the ground of a kind of relative reality. Here we are, we're kind of we heal. We can't quite say what kind of reality we have because it's beyond our conceptualization, but it's some kind of reality. We can't say exactly what. And, but when we're free of the conceptualization, we can experience what, and we will realize that this relative is actually simultaneously the absolute. It's the perfect. So it's very non-dualistic, the Vijnanavada. It's, it's Mahayanistic, very big on compassion. And it considers itself to be a middle way. Oh, thank you, Tashila. Uh, it, it conceives itself to be a, a middle way uh, be between uh, sort of too much of a kind of existentialism and then too much of a kind of nihilism. Because Dorkhaba proves in the longer versions of the second chapter, which, which are not in this summary because I'm trying to get his holiness in the short time that we have to teach this, not to take this in much detail, but to go on to the, the central way, the centrist or middle way uh, school of Nagarjuna. Uh, but in the longer version of this, this Asanga who comes a couple of hundred years after Nagarjuna, uh, he is worried because people are misunderstanding Nagarjuna and the Prajnaparamita Sutras as being more nihilistic than they are. And, um, and they're getting lost in that. And so he's saying, no, there's not, it's not just like, absolutely speaking, nothing is real. But relatively speaking, it's sort of relatively real. And that's like a dream. It's like a dreamlike reality. So it's, uh, it has that kind of unreal quality like a dream. And I don't want, you know, that you're too much going to take that as nihilism. So I'm providing you a middle way by giving you a real relative that's there beyond your conceptualization. And that fits with Buddha and Buddha himself. And they based that on Buddha's own teaching in the Lankavatara Sutra, Sandhya Mochara Sutras, and in several other sutras. Quite, the Buddha taught a lot of sutras. <laughs> you have to realize that, you know, Christianity comes from a few gospels, and actually they're more like 16 gospels because there's a bunch that they threw out and said they were not real than the four that are in the, in the uh, Christian New Testament. But... Uh, there are a lot more of them, actually, Thomas and many others. But, um, and he only taught for four years, and Buddha taught for 45 years. So he had a long, he blabbed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Although, as I said, the Zen master, he said he never said a word. People just thought he was talking. But that, the garrulous non-speaking filled the dragon king's cave with text. <laughs> Somebody had to typeset those texts, too, and write them down for the Nagas. The Nagas did it. They, the Nagas did it and took them down under the ocean. <laughs> Better than Columbia Press, sort of a little bit like underwater like Columbia <laughs> Press. Yeah. Okay, I'm just teasing my friend William. So I just, all I left in from this whole long thing, very elaborate, and Zonkapa's understanding of the idealism is very, very elaborate. And one thing I want to say, and he also says, you know, because everybody jumps to Madhyamaka, to the centrist view or the middle way view, uh, lay, you know, and says, oh, who needs that mind only? You know, that people go like that. Not in, in Tibetan circles, uh, in, not in East Asia. East Asia, their, their view really pretty much is the Madhyamaka, I mean, the Vijnanavada, because they're a great translator of the later era, uh, Shanzang, the one who went with the monkey, you know, the, the whole story, the prince. He brought back mostly Vijnanavada writings, idealist uh, writings, mind-only writings. And later on, not him, but some followers of his who had a big translation institute, when some people arrived a little later with a lot of Madhyamaka writings, they, and the emperor gave them a, an institute and said, you translate those, the, the Xuanzang people who were well-established sneaked over and burned them down. <laughs> and they burned the books down too. They did. They went and they burned out all the copies of Chandrakirti and Nagarjuna and some of this other institute because they didn't want the competition. It's really terrible what translators have done over the centuries with each other's work. It really is terrible. It's like Kyo Lodzawa. There was one famous uh, Lodzawa who became a teacher of the early Sakyapas. And he and Marpa were sharing a ferry boat across, or a canoe, or whatever it was, across the Ganges both going back after spending time doing research in India and both bringing back big bundles of books. So I don't know, Marpa took a nap or what? You know, Marpa was a little bit lazy and overweight. So maybe he was napping. I don't know what happened. 
But when he woke up, Jolotar had thrown all his books overboard. He took all Marpa's books and threw them overboard. You know, sacred, fabulous books. And then he rushed off to, like, I've got the books, you know, and they landed in Tibet. Marpa had to go back and spend another year collecting another batch of books. It's in Marpa's biography. So this kind of thing has been going on, you know. Uh, of course, not today, no. <laughs> Never today. Anyway, uh, but he talks about reification, and, it, and the Vijayanavadans were so great, and Zonkapa loves them. And I got to love them too, myself, when I realized that for a realist, and we all are naive realists in a way, because we all think like, you know, that's real, you know, and really real, not just real, but really real, you know, this piece of wood and my hand, you know. And, uh, and so critical realism of different kinds of the individual vehicle philosophical schools is, is each one of the different schools kind of moves a little further away from just the sort of un unreflective, unexamined life of thinking everything is really real the way it is. And you begin to see, well, it's not real, it's real this way, but not that way. You know, like atomic physics or science today, you know, they say this is not really real like this. It's actually all these atoms and things, you know, and mostly empty and so on, it says. And they, but we, we, that doesn't really come into what we think of as our common sense world, but that's, that's still more real, supposedly, because it's a deeper level of investigation and the result of deeper, deeper examination. They've come to see it as atomic, and then, of course, quantum saw it disappear, which really they still haven't coped with in the centuries since that happened. So the Buddhists are doing a similar thing. And even Buddha, as you notice here, he said, you know, Buddha, he stands up, you know, after his enlightenment moment, and he says, Eureka, wow, I know everything now. I understand it all. I'm so happy. And then he says, but I can't describe it. It's beyond my concepts, just like this idea. But I understand everything, and I'm happy, and I realize you can all understand. Although he first said, well, I don't think anybody will understand, so there's no point talking. But that was just being, he was just being coy to be asked by God, by Brahma, to go and teach. And then he did teach, of course, for 45 years without stopping. But um, so, so he was, it's this sort of thing of like, well, yes, it's real, and you can understand it. But in order to understand it, you have to go beyond what you think is understanding, where you think you understand something because you know its name. You think, I think I understand that pillar because I know some properties of the pillar. And if I just think it's a pillar, you know, and it seems substantially to be a pillar to me. So therefore, I, oh yeah, I know what that is. That's a pillar, you know. So that kind of dualistic knowledge by pre-existing concepts has a certain usefulness in the relative world, but it doesn't really understand what that pillar really is. No way. You know, then the scientists will take it chemically, atomically, Architects will take it, you know, having to do with tension and weight support, and et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and there, so there'll be all different levels of more deep understanding of it. And of course, the Buddhists say, finally, understanding of it is just seeing right through it. <laughs> and seeing it like a, like a dream projection, which, of course, is really hard to think of for us, who would just clock go into it. You know, I bang my forehead on a piece of, on a board doing carpentry this weekend. So then, oh, that does, that's just too real for me. <laughs> so, but this, this is the reification. He, so I left in a little bit about his critique of reification because it's quite good, you know. The two extremes are repudiation and reification, which are kind of like, you know, absolutism and nihilism, which are the, the two extremes from Buddha's time. So reification on page seven, the habitual conviction arising from the reification of an intrinsic identity, actually in existence, which is a reality posed by verbal designation of substances such as the form full, that which has a form, and of things such as form, like substance and quality. Repudiation is the repudiation of authentic actuality, saying it does not exist at all anywhere although it exists ultimately with an inexpressible nature and serves as support and basis of designative verbal signs that see it in the, in the, you know, in the conceptualized way. It should be recognized that these two ruinous mental activities are utterly, utterly destructive of our religious discipline. 
So here he's giving a middle way between repudiation and reification. And he's, you know, oh yeah, and then I was thinking why I like Vijnanabhada because when you rise from the individual vehicle, at least as, as far as the universal vehicle people consider it a rise, you, you do so by becoming, taking bodhisattva vow and adopting bodhisattva attitude and saying, which is easy in a culture or is, has a certain logic in a culture like that of Buddha's time and subsequently Nagarjuna's and so on's time, where the continuity of the soul from former and future lives, beginningless former lives and endless future lives is a matter of common sense. It's not anything mystical. It's not anything abstruse. We have to have blind faith about. It's just a matter of common sense because everything in the universe has continuity. No one can point to something coming from nothing or something becoming nothing. It cannot be pointed to. You burn a log and the log does, ceases to exist, but it, heat emerges and ashes and so forth. There's always continuity. And so much so that uh, even our materialists have the law of thermodynamics of the conservation of energy, second law of thermodynamics. And that goes along with the law about how the, there's, uh, you know, no, no matter can be created out of nothing. Which they, so it's always been there, in other words, in different forms. So for matter, they have the continuity that is all that anybody has ever observed in the world. And, uh, and so to take the idea that there's something radically discontinuous, the one discontinuous thing is the human mind or the animal mind, the anima, you know, the soul, is like that's what requires a leap of faith. That's what is mysterious, actually. Since no one can give an example of seeing anything be nothing or come from nothing. Uh, or, and no one can give an example of nothing. <laughs> Eureka. Newsflash. There is no nothing. I won't harp on that. And so, when you feel that the world is mental, essentially, which is the Vijnanavada, then when you say, I'm going to take the whole world with me to, into freedom from suffering and enlightenment, then it doesn't seem so like a gargantuan task that if you're a realist, either naive or critical, according to the either just unexamined life or beginning philosophical critical realists of this different kinds, like you have an individual vehicle, philosophical view, uh, you know, uh, repertoire, where you'd say, I'm going to save the whole world. I mean, when you think of it as a huge piece of real estate, it's ridiculous, kind of. And of course, even more for materialists who think they only have one life, then it's completely absurd. And you know, you, it's, you definitely you do need lithium or librium or something. <laughs> if someone thinks they're going to save the world, this life. But mentally, the idea that, because we know we, the mind is very mercurial and very changeable, and everybody knows that by personal experience. So when you think the world is a mind, even without too much thought, then somehow the courage of saying, well, I'm going to take it all with me, all these other minds, because they see they're all mercurial and transformable. And so then if Buddha is defined as a being that transforms the whole world, in addition to his self, into freedom from suffering, then, uh, then you sort of aspire to that. You can kind of aspire to that. And then if you add to that the idea that you have an infinite time with the whole world anyway, it becomes like a little bit more reasonable to take that heroic messianic attitude, if you will. OK, so then. Uh, the chapter, so the chapter one and two, which we already discussed, so I'm, I want to just get beyond that. As you note in the summary, I don't have much from chapter one and two, although they're fairly long. If you know the book, they are like you know a bunch of pages, and quite complicated, because this three reality theory or three nature theory, and three unreality theory that Asanga elaborates based on the Samdhya Mochana, the Elucidation of Intention Sutra is very complex because it's a beautiful thing of where a person becomes more aware of how their concepts construct their world and their sense of external solidity of things. And they deconstruct those things, actually, in a very critical manner. And just I want to say ahead of time, before getting to the Madhyamakas, although some of the Madhyamakas 
criticize strongly the, well, actually all of them do in various ways, strongly the, the idealist, the Vijnanavadas, and they seem to be resurrecting the external object as a, as a thing over there, outside of us. In a way, they are not rejecting the idea that the world is more mental than physical. They're not really rejecting that. They're just saying, since the mental world is not a subjective idealism or just in my mind, because it's a, it's a world in all of our minds, and, it, and our minds intersect when we interact with each other, that therefore is this, something like an intersubjective mind field is what the world is. Like in the Vimalakati Sutra, the Buddha says, the world is not a bunch of real estate. The world is the field of the minds of living beings, the interactive field of the minds of really living beings, he says. And the, but living beings includes gods, demons, insects, etc., beings in hell, etc., for the Buddhas, not just human beings. And uh, so in such a world of intersubjective, what the, what the centrists are actually saying is that it's more convenient on the relative level to allow other physical objects to exist outside of your mind. Because that's more close to how it is relativistically perceived. But he's not saying there's some essential physical thing that is, you know, a thing in itself that's physical. He's not doing that. So Dzongkapa later critiques people who think that, well, the centrist, the Madhyamakas, the middle wayists or the centrists, they just come back to the most ordinary conventional reality. No, that's not true. Because it's a, they reconstruct a conventional reality out of perceiving the interwovenness of the minefield of beings. So still, the mental and transformability of the world is still apparent. Hello there. Oh, you are looking at the pillar. You were looking through the pillar to listen to me and see me. It's a great yogini over there. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> you can move. It's okay. I like to see you. That's nice, especially your smile. So, uh, okay. So, so that's that's chapter two, and then of course one thing. And you know, Asanga argues for this middle thing, and also, Asanga considers intrinsic identity to be something that makes language meaningful. And it is only happens uh, in the relative, and the relative and absolute together, which is this ineffable relativity, which he wants to posit as being there so people won't become nihilists. Even though, uh, you know, this identification process is just, uh, has an illusory quality to it, it still happens. And so he, he doesn't think intrinsic identity, the word intrinsic, leads to an idea of ultimacy is one of his things, which we'll see some of the, of the later Mariamakas also think. Okay, so that just is going back over what we went over before. And there are a lot of things, for those of you who just came, there are a lot of things we also discussed about Buddhism, not just being meditation, and that one's conceptual attitude is what leads one's meditation, and therefore the Buddhist education system from the beginning was a complete worldview review, you could say, or it was development of critic and wisdom is considered highly developed critical intelligence from being critical of conditioning, critical of, con of naive concepts, critical of, of uh, reality worldviews that are unrealistic and so forth. And uh, therefore, this kind of philosophical thing has relevance to the path of liberation. You know, these kind of objections have been answered before, and we, I can't go back into all of that right away. And it goes a little bit against how people, some people understand Buddhism as just sort of meditating and emptying the mind, meaning not thinking anything. And that's, that's wrong. So we've been through a lot of that, a lot of us, and I'm sure you don't want to hear. Those of you who are here don't want to hear it all over again. Although it, it helped to hear. You know, because you have to sharpen your wits, in other words, not dull them. Okay, now chapter 3, though. Now in chapter 3, he introduces a different version of uh, definitive and interpretable. And uh, right away he comes with this, they the, the use the Akshaya, Akshaya Mati Nirdesha Sutra, which is like the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra. There are these sutras where the Buddha goes into Samadhi in the sutra, 
or in some way or another, and then somebody else actually teaches sort of inspired by the Buddha or equal with the Buddha in some way. There's a number of those, and those are called like Vimalakirti Nirdesha, taught by Vimalakirti, although Buddha's in the sutra. And Vimalakirti starts with Buddha sending people to see Vimalakirti, it ends with Vimalakirti bringing the whole assembly of people back to talk to Buddha, and, but the main teaching is given by Vimalakirti. And this same in this case, this is someone called Aksharamati. And Aksharamati means something like endless intelligence, Aksharamati, or indestructible intelligence, Aksharamati. Mati means intelligence. The savior Nagarjuna and his son Aryadeva did not differentiate interpretable and definitive by means of a direct reference from a sutra source differentiating the two. So they, in other words, here Dzongkhapa is claiming, oh yes, and, and remember there was the point he made in the prologue, or what I call the prologue in my translation, where uh, he says that you cannot make definitive and say, this sutra is the real one, the others are no good, or there is interpretable, because he gives different interpretive strategies in different sutras. So when he teaches one to one group of people, he makes it, this is the real thing for you, so he says, this is definitive for you. But then later he says on a different one that has some slightly contradictory idea in it, he says, this is definitive for you, but that's because He's a Socratic teacher who teaches according to the inclinations and the needs and the misunderstandings of the different people so that they can each one proceed optimal effectively to their own understanding, to clearing away their misunderstanding. <clears throat> so he says that. Nevertheless, the matter is explained by them by implication from the way in which they explain the meaning of the sutras. So in other words, although they use reason to differentiate interpretable and definitive, they base themselves also on specific sutra quotes and so forth. Furthermore, the lucid exposition, the wisdom lamp commentary, and the central way illumination, these are specific works in the center school, take the teaching of Akshayamati as authority when they set forth the interpretation of interpretable and definitive. Therefore, this sutra should be taken as, an authorit as authoritative here, although it is taken that way because it fits with reasoning, is what they're saying, rather than they're just being dogmatic about it. So to quote Akshay Mati, he says, which sutras are definitive in meaning and which are interpretable? Those teaching superficial realities are interpretable in meaning. Those teaching ultimate realities are definitive in meaning. So here he goes beyond the, a historical kind of framework where it's more discriminating or less discriminating or it's more realistic or more nihilistic. And he goes to content. If they talk about ultimate reality, they're definitive. If they talk about relative reality or superficial reality, they are interpretable. This is a new definition. Those teaching various words and letters are interpretable, so something for literalism. Those teaching the profound the difficult to see and the difficult to understand are definitive. That's emptiness, you know, ultimate reality. Those sutras that teach as if there were an owner in the ownerless, using various expressions such as self, living being, life, soul, creature, person, humanity, mankind, agent, experiencer, etc., are interpretable. Those sutras that teach the doors of liberation which are, which are emptiness of things, signlessness, wishlessness, and inactivity, or activitylessness, non-production, creationlessness, non-occurrence, beinglessness, lifelessness, personlessness, and ownerlessness are definitive in meaning. Rely on the latter and not the former. So here, it could have been in any one of the first Wheel of Dharma time when he was teaching, you know, teaching the disciples the Four Noble Truths or the Four Holy Truths, he could have said certain things about ultimate reality to them that would have been definitive. So some of his activity during the first wheel could be definitive. You have to, you have to analyze by content, in other words. And even in the Pradnya Paramita, where he's really talking about this unreality and selflessness and emptiness more forcefully and more consciously and more repetitively, I could say, uh, there, he may sometime be talking about, well, now do you take care of yourself or do something. He may speak about self or 
something or you know, future life, whatever it might be, and that those parts of it are interpretable. Only the negation is definitive, in other words, is what they're saying. And this is really important. But the next two phrases do not depart from this arrangement. It says, teaching the superficial, teaching the superficial is teaching various meanings, employing various expressions. And teaching the ultimate is teaching the meaning that is difficult to understand, which is the universality of the cessation of mental fabrications. The last two phrases describe, et cetera. So he just, you're doing a word commentary there. But this is really key in the sense that it actually relates to the scientific nature of Buddha's teaching. It connects to that. If we are saying by science the empirical investigation of the nature of reality, and we're not just conflating science per se with scientific materialism, which is a dogmatic worldview, that which, which itself claims that's all science, There's no, that's the only science. But that's really philosophically naive of them. Science is the quest to understand reality. And the great thing about, about it is it's empirical. And if you know Karl Popper's work or some, you know, and other philosophers of science, mostly they agree with Popper, that that means that all theories are hypotheses that are, ref are the best way of accounting for the experience cumulatively that the scientific community and the world community has had. But if they have new experiences and new experiments, and, they, and this, this theory no longer, this hypothesis no longer explains them properly, they contradict this hypothesis, then you have to reject those theories. So it's sort of the non-dogmatic, non-conceptually uh, absolutist idea of science as experience or experiment. Experiment really means experience. The exploration of reality itself rather than theories about reality. Do you follow that? Do you get that? Now, if that's the case, since what the Buddha is saying, that only the negations of signlessness, emptiness, selflessness, soullessness, substancelessness, theorylessness, actually, in a way that those are, you know, those are negating all theories. So that's the only thing that's definitive. You remember, like we discussed last time, the, 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 the phenomenology of negation. When you understand a negative, there's no, there's no Buddha in this room. Well, that would be wrong. There's a statue, but no living Buddha in this room. Then what would a Buddha look like, et cetera? What would a Buddha be doing if they were here, et cetera? Then you sort of eventually get tired of looking around. Buddha, where's Buddha? Like George Bush was doing when he was looking for, for the nuclear weapons of mass destruction. Remember, he was looking around under the bed, under the couch, like silly boy. You get tired of that, you say there are none here. You know? But you did, that was your decision. Because you didn't find something you could cling on to. You just couldn't find what you were looking for. So in a way, a negation leads you to an opening of your mind, actually. Rather than closure, like, okay, that's a pillar. I found it. You follow me? Which is what we think of as a positive cognition, concept, concept guided positive cognition. A negational cognition is also concept guided, but in a way where it leaves you in an open thing of just not finding what you had the concept you wanted to find. You follow me? So it's a different kind of understanding. And uh, so therefore it's an opening understanding. So it opens your mind. You didn't find that thing you thought was, should be there. And you, therefore you have, and you haven't found the failure to found. You just get tired of looking. You decide I no longer look. You haven't found the failure to find. You just fail to find. You may sustain that, and that openness of mind that may bring you to sort of merging with this place that is empty of what you thought might have been in it. So you dissolve into that through that openness of mind, if you follow me. Negation leads you in that direction. And though only such, te such teachings that are thus negate, ne pure negation, and they even reject, in Nagarjuna and people do, what they call an implicative negation, or what in modern logic you call context-bound negation. In other words, if you know that, they say, uh, in the context where Devadatta is fat, when you say 
Devadatta doesn't eat anything in the daytime. And yet he's a big slob. He's overweight like most of our countrymen. And you then say, ah, he's eating at night. So it implies an opposite thing that you understand. You know, if you just say, you know, Brahmins don't drink beer, that's their fav favorite one. You're not saying they drink anything else. You just don't, it's like a pure prohibition, pure negation. And emptiness and selflessness is like that. It's not implying anything else. It's just saying there is no self. You know, beings are empty of self defined as intrinsically identifiable substantial essence, independent essence, unchanging, fixed essence. So then he has a nice thing here, because the word neyarta, which means interpretable meaning, before this translation, nobody used this phrase interpretable. I originated this phrase. <laughs> and it, was just a, it means it could be interpreted. And certain people who don't like to follow my examples, they always say every time, that requires interpretation. They don't, they don't have a single word for it. Because <laughs> they don't want to follow the word I use. Definitive, they, I also am the first one to use definitive, but they do use that one. Because they thought maybe no one would know they were following me. But interpretable, they won't use. They just say, every time they say, oh, that requires interpretation. They don't mind the extra syllables. <laughs> but in Sanskrit uh, philosophy and in uh, liter literature, they say that a writer, a Sanskrit writer, a philosopher, considers the saving of a syllable to be more valuable than the birth of a son. <laughs> Bunch of chauvinist idiots. Really. <laughs> Silly, but it's, it shows that serious matter. Okay, so, so this is interpretable. Because neya means to be led, you know, so a meaning to be led. So it's not a meaning which leads people around to some other thing, which in other contexts, in like, in, in Theravada literature, Neyarta can mean that, a meaning that leads people. But this doesn't mean that. This means the meaning itself has to be led to something else. In that sense, interpreted to be some, mean something else. It doesn't mean the people are led by it. So he says that. Rather, the meaning of the to be led is the process of interpretation in which it is necessary to lead the obvious meaning of the sutra around to a different meaning. And then he explains that and so on. So then he goes on about Nagarjuna. And then comes to the, this is a key, this is crucial. And this, in a way, I think this is Buddha, the Mahayana's greatest thing, and Buddha's greatest thing. And in the case of Tibet, it's Tsongkhapa's greatest thing. And let me explain this. It's the second section. Well, let's see, well, let's, let's see what he says. Uh, or the translation of what he says there. The explanation of their meaning, the savior Nagarjuna's explanation. The equivalence of relativity and realitylessness. The sutras declare both the existence and the non-existence of production and cessation, etc. Some of them explaining the statements of non-production, etc. as definitive in meaning, and some of them explaining them as interpretable in meaning. So here he's saying these other sutras, like the previous one, they just say they're interpretable, you know, and, and like Asanga and the, and the Elucidation of Intention Sutra interpreted them. So they weren't accepting this way of understanding definitive and interpretable, he says. If there were any logical refutation of the literal validity of the explanations of the non-existence of production, etc., in the ultimate or by intrinsic identity, then it would be correct to explain the objective self, which is that negated, that means the selflessness of objects. And here, at first, that sounds wrong to us. Like, how can a table have a self? But if you understand self as the reflexive, intrinsic essence of something, and if you realize that in language, we do say, no, no, I don't mean the book or something. I mean the table itself. So we do use self to sort of, when we want a word or something or our mind, to go back to whatever we consider the essential object is. The pillar itself, the house itself, the building itself, the the bomb itself, the plane itself, the president himself, himself, yes, person, but we also do use self about things. So objective object, so objective selflessness is the deeper level of selflessness, actually. And then the Vinyanavada people think that the individual vehicle, you know, the Hinayana people, the, the individual vehicle people, you know, the Theravadas and others, they have only understood 
personal selflessness. They have an experience of, they have the face falling off experience, as it's called in Zen, which I like. The experience of, and which is very good. Personality, you know, person comes from the Latin word persona, which means a mask, actually. So when you have that experience of your face falling off, in other words, you realize the impersonal, you're this process, actually. And you're not, your personality is not a fixed, independent thing. It's a constantly changing thing. That's a great thing. But then you still think you have real hands and feet and face and body and life and death. And so you haven't uh, realized the, the, the selflessness of yourself as a process of a collection of things, collection of processes, events. You know, you haven't realized that. According to the Vijnanabhara, now the Prasangika has a little other view of that. They, the dialecticist has a different view. But that, I'll get to that later. In any case, what is amazing here is if realitylessness or emptiness, which in a way is the topic of definitive meaning teachings and is pure negation and is, you know, the fact that everything dissolves under analysis, etc., all this kind of thing. If that is so, then uh, uh, you might think the normal thing to think, and religious mystics in Buddhism and throughout other religions, wherever they were bit yogis, you know, monastics usually, or mystics, uh, unusual people, they sort of think that, and I, we talked about this last time, that when you have an experience of everything dissolving under analysis, including yourself, you have what they call the space-like equipoised samadhi or one-pointed concentration that is balanced and equipoised like space, where you experience that your tense self looking for reality of itself sort of melts into vast space and feels that as a big blissful release, you're very well going to think that that's an experience of ultimate reality. Because just as you and I see this pillar as if it were something very solid, to us it's an incontrovertibly real experience. If it, seeing it could be a delusion, we go bump into it, that's not a delusion, then we have a, we have a bump on our head. Then imagine you come to a state through yogic adeptness and expertise and long practice and severe strict concentration where you come into a place of total dissolution and you are one with an infinity of space, what it seems like. And that, because other things dissolved into it, differentiated things all seem to melt into it and were seen through and disappeared, actually. You can be, you would understand, you would feel this is the one thing that is really real. You wouldn't even have to say that. You would feel it would just like you become this solid pillar of infinite space infinite space experienced by you as a solid pillar. And it's not like you wrap your arms around the pillar or you're floating in it with your body. Your body has dissolved into it and your mind and your point of subjective, you know, the subject different from object, uh, you know, isolation or alienation or differentiation has dissolved and you are that vast space. Then you arrive. I mean, where else is there to go? Then there's no more momentum of going anywhere. So naturally you think you're enlightened. You know, why not? And, this, and it feels great. But you're not all stressed out in your body anymore. And then you take some dualistic teaching about Nirvikapa Samadhi, Chitta Vrti Niroda, some super dualistic teaching like that body. Well, who needs a body? That's somehow a bunch of boring business. And now Chitta Vrti Niroda, the mind has ceased its functioning. Or a Buddhist version of that, everything ceases. And it's just pure nirvana. And that's it. End of story. Liberation. Bye. <laughs> so, but non duality means that the momentum of experimental inquiry, of experiential inquiry, like what is real, testing everything, what is real, like the, like the trajectory is such that without having a body, without having a concept, without having a sense of self opposite from the object, 
except in a kind of really residual momentum type way, the person who is who understood clearly the rule of royal, what they call the royal reason or the rule of relativity, this state of disappearance will not be accepted as an ultimate state because it's still a state. And there may be no memory actually at first of having ever first come into that state. But so at a deep subliminal level, there is an awareness of having now because there's a feeling of release. So release of what? There was something to be released. So there's a sense of having achieved this, moved from somewhere else into this. Once that is the case, this is not absolute. It's relational. And so the momentum of that such a being who is oriented by understanding ahead of time who is not ready to misinterpret this thing, then will push them past it and they'll come into what is called the dreamlike aftermath samadhi, or the illusion-like or the magical aftermath samadhi, right? Where prishtalabdha samadhi, what they call. So at which point they, it's all disappeared, but it's back. It's like, you know, you're watching the movie and the screen goes blank and it's just a white screen and then the movie comes on again. But since you didn't walk into it, you know, before they turned the movie on, so when you came in, there was the Pandora and the Avatar and the weird sergeant was there and the guys with the blue tails climbing the trees and the cute female the great archer saving his life and then telling him to shut up. <laughs> and he goes, no, you're naughty, naughty. And then she's about to whack him one. And then those little things come trickling down. She sees him all lined up in his little white tentacles of the of Ewa. And so you think that's all there is. And then it's all went white. And then, you, oh, wow, it's just a blank screen, really. And then the, and then, but the screen, what is that? And then the movie comes back on the screen. But now it's different because, in a way, once it has totally disappeared under analysis, you know it's a magical, dreamlike quality. And so you take it, you, your, your reification habit pattern, as the Vijnanavadas would call it, or your intrinsic identity habit pattern, as the centrists would call it, is, has a little less traction. And even the royal reason of relativity is so cool that even when you come back, say you're doing samadhi here in this room and everything is space-like and you and the pillar dissolve into pure, vast, luminous space, and then the pillar's back, then, then uh, the fact that it seems really solid again, as if it was a pillar in itself, is illusionary. It's, you're more, it's more, the fact that it seems solid the fact that it seems anything is relating to it, and your sense of relatedness to it is intensified, and the sense of it as an externalized, intrinsic, independent, autonomous, you know, object in itself, intrinsic, identifiable, objective, and real object, is lessened. Even though you're seeing it in the same habitual way you saw it before. Shankarbha makes this point in, the, in this book and in other ones, that the illusion like aftermath samadhi the key about it is people might be thinking that you're supposed to see through everything. It's all supposed to look like rainbows and things. But not necessarily, he says, because it looks just as solid as it did before, just as intrinsically well as it did before. But you, since it has disappeared, you now realize the illusory, the constructed nature of that. And even the solidity of its appearance mirrors its disappearability to you, if you follow me. The fact that it seems solid. This then is when you know the royal reason of relativity. And this is what he's celebrating. And this is what Tsongkhapa is celebrating. And you know, he was attacked afterwards. I mentioned this in earlier class, but to mention it again by some other people. And they were all religious virtuosos or virtuosi. They were all really great yogis. And they, they were those who were really reluctant 
to say, both and for this and before Tonkavai in India, there were those who were like this too, not only non-Buddhists, Buddhists, they were really reluctant to say that they hadn't really felt some sort of nirvana when they, when everything else, when everything disappeared and they disappeared into it. And they were really reluctant to say that was not ultimate reality, actually. That was just a failure to find the ultimacy in relative reality. And the last place where it seems to be ultimacy is in what seems like ultimate reality, because everything else seems to have disappeared into it. But since things disappeared into it, it's relative. And emptiness was there from the beginning, and all the relative things are already empty, emptiness. Emptiness is the relationality of all these things, and, there, and there's no non-relational component of them that's relating. You follow me, except to our, in our conceptuality. So what that does, and this is where, this is the great thing, I think, about the Buddha and the whole tradition is the world does not disappear. Just because you feel better, that hasn't changed necessarily other people right away. And you're going to stay with these other people. This means that compassion is actually the greatest thing. Not just some wisdom of some sort of isolated state that you can have a, you're so smart that you can just think your way out of the universe and then not have to bother with the people and their problems. Of, and and not, not just people, beings, you know. Monkeys are people too. There's, a chim there's, a, there's an orangutan who calls people up on Skype Seriously, I forget where he is. Maybe probably in Italy. <laughs> but there is. There's a orangutan who can Skype and does Skype people. He Skypes his trainer, Skypes people. He knows how to Skype you. He says, Hello, morning. He says, eh. He's eating his banana and, you, and he's, uh, he's Skyping and chatters with you or whatever. whatever. I don't know what they say. So. The religious virtuoso, because you know, the samadhi lover who can really achieve samadhi. And this is also why, in this context, if you go ask a Tibetan, uh, uh, honest Tibetan teacher, I mean really honest, oh, Guruji, I want to meditate, or Lama La, I want to meditate, I want to meditate, I want to go on retreat, you meditate. They will say, Do you know what are the three jewels? Do you know what karma is? Uh, are you nice to your parents? Are you good? Uh, what, what is your livelihood? What do you do for a living? You know, they'll go right back to ethical reality with you and where you're at and what's going on and then bit by bit and then maybe later meditate. They will even discourage you to meditate right away because, you know, Americans, why do we just jump to meditate all the time? Oh, yeah, man. Oh, yes. Guru Swami Sukamaka. <laughs> oh, I, a weekend, and then I will know my true self. Oh, I'm going to go do that. Great, you know. It's in California, too. <laughs> they have a spa. <laughs> Point is, you know, your mind is really powerful. And if you get in the wrong direction, you're stuck. You're going to be stuck. And, and or if you go to a kind of meditation where they tell you, don't think anything, all there is that you know is all wrong, and don't think anything, then you're not going to think about what an idiot Swami Kukamaka is. <laughs> no, seriously, when he makes you eat some kind of weird thing off a banana leaf while well, he's like having a hot dog. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Because you lose your critical thing. And the critical thing is where you have to start. What's, why, why, do I, what's, why am I discontented? Why am I having an unhappy life? Why am I mean to so-and-so? Why do I lose my temper? What's wrong? What should I be doing? What's the meaning of life? Am I going to have another life? Why do I think I don't? These are key things. Do I own stock in a company that makes weapons, chemicals, buys oil, uh, whatever, you know? You know? Do I? Then I'm doing something unethical if I do. I'm supporting something unethical. Then I'm having bad dreams at night. Oh, it's not because I didn't know how to meditate. It's because I'm living like a pig. Seriously, I'm pretending I don't know what they're doing to chickens in these places where they cut their beaks and claws and they all never move their whole life and then 
have to be, uh, they lay these eggs and then they take them and they, I don't know. Never mind. I don't want to go into all of that. I'm just saying that that's the fact. And then, of course, meditation is super essential if you get, if you have some understanding of, you know, the Eightfold Noble Path of the Theravada. This is not Mahayana. Theravada. First branch of Eightfold Noble Path is realistic worldview. Realistic worldview means ro ultimately royal reason of relativity. All things uh, that are, are impermanent because they are produced from causes and once something is produced, all relative things are impermanent and produced from causes. Once things are produced from causes, they will deteriorate later and they will constantly change. You know, that's real, that kind of thing is realistic worldview. Selflessness is realistic worldview. Wisdom is realistic worldview. Then second, once you have realistic worldview, and, there, and therefore, for example, even in that, why then, even with our trinity, why is the second branch of noble path realistic motivation? What does that mean? Samyak samkalpa. It's a conceptual thing, motivation. It's not, not thinking or meditating. It's realistic motivation. Why? Because realistic worldview includes the fact of relativity, and relativity is expressed causally in terms of what is called karma, which just means cause and effect. It doesn't mean fate, the three sisters, God's going to do this or that to you or whatever. God would like you to be happy, but they don't control you completely. You're in a causal nexus as long as you're in the relative world, and so it includes karma. Once you realize that you are enmeshed in a network of causality, negative causes produce negative results, there are negative things in your mind, in your culture, in your speech, and in your body. If you behave badly and are harmful, and those negative things will produce really negative effects. So you need to develop an understanding of what is negative and what is positive so you can make sure to be positive. Because whatever is negative about you, body, speech, or mind, is going to produce to you a negative effect. It's not like religion telling you that. It's not God telling you that. It's not, it's not some authority telling you that. It is facing the reality of your embeddedness in a causal network, nexus. And therefore taking responsibility of being in this causal network and not having simplistic excuses of how to get out of it, although in dualistic Buddhism, he lets people think there's a nirvana outside of it. And in a way, there is. But it's some weird thing where it's outside and inside at the same time. But never mind about that. Never mind about that. So I'm not saying that Mahayana means there is no nirvana. As long as there's samsara, there's nirvana. Once there's no more samsara, then there's no more nirvana. But that's nirvana. So, but never mind, we're not getting into that right now. We're just saying th those two things are done. Then when you have realistic motivation and you have realistic worldview, you realize you're all stuck in causation, then you've got to make causation good. So your motivation comes to make everything good. Then realistic speech, realistic action of body, speech, and mind, realistic livelihood, there are three branches of pure ethic. And it's against no meditation yet. No meditation. Two things about reorienting your worldview and then getting your motivation aligned with your worldview. And then three things about ethic. So you're not making negative causes of being harmful with speech, harmful in your actions, harmful with whatever you do as a livelihood. Then that begins to give you a basis of being able to use your life well. Then there's realistic creativity, I call it, or effort, they say. But it's not effort in the bad. It's only effort in positive direction. So I don't know what word we can use. But, so I like creativity because it's the kind of positive effort we... Well, you can be a creative murderer, of course. <laughs> you know, really clever, you know, like, like uh, you know, one of Sherlock Holmes' uh, like, uh, cases, you know. But it's rare. We think of creativity as doing something beautiful and good, you know. So I, try, I kind of like that word for that, that one. Virya, heroic creativity, it is. And then finally, mindfulness and meditation. Mindfulness and consciousness, the last two of the eight branches. In other words, when you've got all that lined up, and when you're ready, when you have the royal reason of relativity, which is realistic worldview, then it's safe to start at this, 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 dismantling the mechanisms of your reactive mind and becoming aware of your unconscious and all the neg 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 negativities that you have inherited from your previous life, even though you're a wonderfully marvel marvelous positive human being relative to other forms of life, 
still there, you, there's still all this instinctual selfishness and greed and, and anger and aggression and destructiveness and murder. Eros and Thanatos, as Freud says. But you become more and more aware of that through mindfulness. And you learn, that after you become aware of it, initially non-judgmentally, and then afterwards critically, where you diminish the negative and reinforce the positive, then you can then safely develop the higher level of concentration of samadhi, where you will really bring to live the most positive element of your mind. Right? So that's all fundamental in Buddhism. And all of this philosophy and all of this essence of true eloquence has to do with that realistic worldview. And the greatest contribution of it is when people are really more grown up and ready for it and ready to take responsibility is that if relativity and reality-lessness are equivalent, doesn't mean they're the same thing, but they're equivalent, they're equal to each other, that means that the real realization of shunyata, of emptiness, is exactly the same thing as the complete commitment to relativity. And the complete commitment to relativity is compassion, is universal compassion, meaning nobody else's suffering is tolerable any longer to you. It's equally intolerable as your own suffering is to you. That's commitment to relativity. So every little thing counts that could be helpful or harmful, more helpful and less harmful. And, you know, it becomes really critical. And I think this is really the greatness of, of Dongkapa in sort of helping the Tibetans who had been working toward this, and there were some great criticisms of his. But still, in general, Tibetans were still seeking liberation in some way as a way of getting out of the mess. And only few of, too few of them were really sort of ready for the responsibility of, of, of seeing, when you see the possibility of freedom, but you realize that it, to really effect it, everyone has to come with you, type of thing. And there is no place of freedom separate from others' freedom or others' bondage. And therefore, you're committed to the being forever. Then that's, then, then, and out of that, you go crazy. That's where, you know, the nirmanic haya, in a way, if you say like Buddhahood, you know, the, if you say the three bodies of Buddhahood, right, the truth body is realizing you're all, it's all one thing, we're all one, all the Buddhas, all the unenlightened beings, everybody's fine, everything is clear light, it's void, blah, blah, blah. But then, and your sambhogakaya, your body of beatific bliss, is your enjoyment of realizing that. But then, it's not immune to your awareness that others who have that as their own right, not just humans either, every animal, every being, everything is made of this, of this bliss, of this nirvana, of this beatitude. It's all one with this. And, and yet they don't know that. And they're really like you're having a hard time. They think really. I mean, to you it's in a way it's unreal. So, you know, it doesn't bring you down but it, it, it's, why not help them feel that themselves? So then you split into millions of beings, they say. Although I, I'm never happy with the Nirmanakaya. Like, where are they? <laughs> you know, the Nirmanakaya. I've always said that. I remember I once had this, this dream where I was scolding Geshe Wangyal, you know, in, I was in Almora, it was during Bangladesh time, and I was getting the news in the radio and the Indian press of the Holocaust going on of the Bengalis by the West Pakistanis, supported by Nixon and Kissinger, of course, bayoneting babies and stuff, brandishing babies on their bayonets, and I mean, really sick stuff. And, and I was like, in the dream, I was like, he was, Geshe was sitting across in the garden, and I was saying, cross-legged, like on a seat. And I said, where's the bloody Nirmanakaya? Where is it? Why isn't the Nirmanakaya have an army of you know, peace soldiers or something out there stopping these atrocities? Where are they? What is this about the Nirmanakaya? As many embodiments as beings require to help them. I was really worked up. And then he didn't say a word. <laughs> he didn't smile. He looked kind of grim. But then he just started increasing in size. 
and you get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I was in this place, Almora, this beautiful place in the Indian Himalaya, where in what's now called Uttarakhand, where there are these 27,000 foot peaks all around you. You can see all these snow-capped peaks, Trishul, Nanda Devi, highest mountains in the Indian Himalaya. And he just blotted them all out. You know. And I was only like a, like a flea at his knee, shaking my fist <laughs> and saying, where are they? You know, <laughs> then I woke up. So somehow it was the message was the way of causality within the relative world is so hugely complex. You know, you can't, you know, there's something going on. And actually later, I guess I would say, I got to understand it sort of as, you know, don't think that just because some people die that they're abandoned by the bodhisattvas and the Buddha. That they, that's a terrible transition that people, difficult transition people go through and they lose their life wrongly and unjustly and, 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 pre and prematurely, but they, they always ha there's always another chance. Of course, there's always, a, for the bad ones, there's a chance of getting, having a much worse life, but they never give up. You know. They never do. Actually, even in Pali text, in Theravada, where they de-emphasize a little bit Buddha's, supposedly it's supposed to be more down to earth, you know, Buddha's just a real red brother human, that kind of thing, you know. People sort of act like that in academia about, about Theravada. But they're full of magical things in Theravada. And there are whole sutras where Buddha is talking to some, a god who's in the bardo and is falling out of heaven. And he used to be the person that Buddha knew. He was temporarily born in heaven for a while, and then he's falling out. And then how to deal with that and what to do with it. Buddha's talking to him, you know, and the disciples are all snoring, and Buddha's like not sleeping. And he's instead talking to somebody in the bardo, you know helping them at those times. And probably they, they, they have to do that, you know. These it's enlightened beings, they help people through the death transition after their death. Because in a way, and you can see logically, that between lives is one of the best times to intervene in someone's, in someone's uh, continuum. <coughs> because everything is very fluid and flexible there. Their mind, the body is just sort of an image in their mind, like in a dream. So if you can encourage them to be really great in that setting, then it will guide them into a really positive life. You know. And vice versa, if they get freaked out and start getting all like curled up in a bowl of, of like thorns, they're going to be reborn as a porcupine, which will not, they'll not be doing a lot of like Dharma study as a porcupine. Anyway, so, so this is that, you know, He goes on here, and here, here um, in the Disclosure of the Spirit of Enlightenment, that's one of His Holiness's favorite uh, texts that he teaches, the Bodhicitta Vivarana, declares that the statements that negate external things and establish reality in mind alone are not literally intended. So here he's questioning a little bit the final validity of the idealist or the uh, mind-only school. And... Uh, he, it's a little critical. He said, just as the grammarians make one read the grammar, this is the famous verse of Nagarjuna's in the Jewel uh, Garland, just as the grammarians make one read the grammar, that, which I prefer to call Jewel Rosary nowadays, actually, I have to change that. Just as the grammarians make one read the grammar, the Buddha teaches the Dharma according to the tolerance of the disciple. To some he teaches the Dharma to refrain from sins. That sort of simple ethical teaching for a layperson. To some to accomplish virtue, that would be those who become mendicants, you know, who drop out of ordinary livelihoods of all kinds and simply try to put their whole mind into evolutionary development in a society that will tolerate them, which in Buddha's time was only India. To some as dependence on dualism, and uh, that's, a, that's the philosophy of the Theravada and the Mahasangha, the, the 17, 18 different Theravada, you know, like um, individual vehicle schools and to some as freedom from dualism. So that includes the, both Vijnanavada and the Madhyamaka. But here I think he means mainly Vijnanavada, the idealist school, Mahayana boundary. And to some he teaches the profound, terrifying practice of enlightenment, whose essence is emptiness and compassion. Which I would, which I would shouldn't that's that famous phrase, shouldn't that And here translating Garba as essence, 
And nowadays I might translate, where emptiness is the womb of compassion, is what maybe I'd rather translate it as. Garba can mean womb, it can mean fetus also, and it can mean essence also. Tong Yin Ying 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 Bhutan, my favorite, and, and Tong Shunya Dakarana Garba. So that means what emptiness is, the, uh, emptiness which gives birth to compassion, that's precisely the super non-duality where you realize nirvana in samsara or samsara as nirvana and thereby, which frees you from samsara. To realize that you have to be free from samsara and yet completely engaged with it for the benefit of others. And realize it's still there for them. But luckily it's unreal so they can get out of it. It's less real, or put it this way, it's less real than their freedom from it is. So you can help them out of it by getting them to find out their own reality. Reality is always stronger than unreality, because reali unreality will revert to reality eventually. It's like a lie is always weaker than truth, because the lie is like, takes, it's strenuous to maintain, and it's not real. The reality is just there, you know, so you don't have to maintain it on, in a relative sense. Yeah, this non-duality refers, you see, he says the next, the, he says the first sentence states the teachings teach the Dharma in according with the intelligence of the disciple. The next two phrases refer to the teachings concerned with ascendant status in the world. The next phrase refers to the teaching of the non-existence of personal self. That's, the, that's then the normal, you know, disciple or hermit Buddha and the existence of both subject and object for those in the class of the true disciple school. The next phrase refers to the teaching of the existence of the emptiness of duality, that is, non-existence of subject-object dualism for certain disciples in the universal vehicle class, that's the Vijnanavana, the idealists. And the rest of the passage refers to the, extreme, the teaching of the awesome dharma of the integrated realitylessness and great compassion for the disciples of extreme intelligence who are oriented towards the universal vehicle. Therefore, as long as we are not capable of the establishment of all arrangements, such as bondage, liberation, etc., upon the doctrine of truthlessness, meaning ultimate truthlessness, the ultimate truth of truthlessness, of relative truthlessness, we must differentiate some things that are untrue from some things that are true. For it is necessary to lead such disciples gradually by teaching partial aspects of selflessness. And it is not proper to present universal emptiness when it would be misinterpreted to mean that there is no basis upon which to establish causality. Therefore, the Buddha declared the procedure of refuting reality in persons and almost not refuting it in the aggregates or processes, you know, the impersonal processes of life, and the procedure of refuting substantial subject-object difference and not refuting the reality of the emptiness of duality itself. So they're not really emphasizing the emptiness of emptiness and therefore inconceivable relativity. So, you know, so sophisticated his expressions. You have your mind, it goes with it. Actually, I've never really taught this work to anyone and who didn't sort of get another level of confidence of their own intelligence by reading it. Which other philosophers do, like Mill, if you read uh, or David Hume, it's wonderful. The Scotch people are great. David Hume, uh, Smith, you know, what's the new guy who wrote The Wealth of Nations? He also wrote a lot of philosophy works before. Adam Smith, yeah. So each one tries not, you know, they, they leave something unrefuted so someone can still hang on to it, you know, at the different levels until finally they can refute and critique everything without, make, without becoming nihilistic. However, when we are able to realize the very import of relativity as the import of reality-lessness, there is no point in making any such differentiation because we are quite capable of the admission of the validity of all arrangements upon that very basis, which is the negation of intrinsic reality. This is a marvelous thing in Nagarjuna's great work. He says, someone says, well, if according to you everything was empty, as according to you, if, if as you say everything was empty, then cause and effect couldn't function and the Four Noble Truths would be wrong. You know, because it's an -Buddhist, intra-Buddhist argument, so, you know, that's, that, that can't be that Four Noble Truths are wrong. So, Nagarjuna then says, well, 
And then he goes on quite a bit about everything doesn't work and everything is wrong. So then Nagarjuna goes through a bunch of things about how that guy is making a mistake. And then he responds with the exact same sentence. He said, if all things were not empty, then there would be no cause and effect and no this and no that. In other words, emptiness makes relativity viable. Why? Because if there was a non-relative core to things, then relativity would freeze to a halt. So I mean, if the real Bob was some non-relative essential thing, Bob couldn't relate to anybody. You know? That there, except the false, some false sort of external things that are not real, the real Bob. If the real Bob was an absolute thing in itself, it couldn't touch another thing. It would be irrelevant to the processes of the real Bob, etc., which is what the dualists say. Your Purusha, the whole dance of Prakriti, of Maya, it's just Maya, it's just illusion, and Purusha never really was involved in it all. You know, I mean, that's what the dualists do say, actually. And even when Buddhists press them, but how do we get involved, you know? And what's so imma immune and immaculate about Purusha anyway? If it sees Maya, then that means that Purusha's subjectivity is subject to change. It's not an unchanging and personal thing. And they say, well, in reality, Purusha is completely Pashanavat, unconscious like a stone. Doesn't know, it doesn't see anything. You know? <laughs> you know, like in other words, when you have a, a knowledge that is like total knowledge of everything, including itself, then there's nothing to know. Then there's no, no knower anymore. You know, they're forced into that idea. So therefore, it would never see a delusory thing. There would be no beginning of the world by the, by the delusion of Maya. You know? There would not be any such thing. So in a, by the way, it's much more radical than dualism. There is no ignorance to start with. So the world has not yet begun. And that a perception of its freedom is bliss. And whether it seems to be going on around you doesn't bother you then. It does bother you that it bothers others, though. And then you're in a great position to help them. Because you're too cheery to be dragged into their drama. And yet you take them as seriously as they need to be taken, they say. Thank heaven. Like this idiot, they took me character. They took me seriously, although they were la they should have been laughing. Okay, uh, we are quite here. To, yes. Nevertheless, even for those in the supreme vehicle class who are in little danger of nihilistic views about causality, etc., there are a great many who, although somewhat roughly negating truth, the negandam or the negati, fail to negate it precisely. For in the face of precise negation, so many lose sight of the functional basis of all systems verified by validating cognitions. That means to say, in the face of precise negation, they get carried away with their experiences of vast emptiness, you know, of space-like cognition. And then they, they lose the basis. They forget that even their experience of emptiness, a seeming emptiness, is itself a relational experience. And therefore, they, they think that it, the real thing is where nothing is happening, and therefore they lose sight of the functional basis of all systems, which is to say emptiness is the basis of all functioning systems. Openness or emptiness is the space within which functioning systems operate. Functioning systems are that emptiness, and therefore they function. There's no non-related thing in all of them which would block their functioning like a sort of like a, like a ice cube in the middle of the flow blocking the pipe. You know? Hence the elucidation of intention, that's that sutra, right? The subject of sutra, differentiation of interpretable and definitive still appears to be an extremely skillful technique for guiding a great many disciples through the universal vehicle. So here the, the thing of leaving a seeming ineffable relativity as in like, yes, you're still real enough. You know, some vestige of the reality that the realist has to think this is the real samsara and there'll be a real nirvana I'll get to. So then by keeping the relative there, the ineffable relative in the three reality theory of the mind-only school, you're leaving that person with a sense of the reality of their mind. So then they can feel that I can't be nothing and it won't be nothing. So then they are still, they feel safe. And then they encourage even, oh, with all of our minds here together, we can transform them into a blissful Buddha life. We can, I can become a Buddha and create a Buddha land. We, and we all together can create a Buddha land. 
So here, this is what's wonderful about true relativity and about the dialecticist and or centrist in general and particularly dialecticist philosophy is that it validates all the other levels of philosophy and even ordinary philosophy. It's like what Vimalakirti says when Manjushri asks him, where is the enlightenment of the Buddha to be found? He says it is to be found in the 62 false views, <laughs> meaning even views that have some flaw in them, some error like dualism or some blind faith religion or whatever it might be, or materialism for that matter, they have something good in them and they're helping some people get a little further towards something. For example, it could well be like the, the European people were terrorized by the church. And you know, they let that idiots in the Inquisition like burn Giordano Bruno at the stake and silence Galileo and they didn't look at what was right in front of their face because they were so frightened of the church. And then the church's big threat on them was if we condemn you, you're going to go to hell. You know, you're going to go down there with Dante's lowest realm of the inferno if we against you. So people were terrified to think for themselves. So in a way then they said, forget you, I'm just a piece of nature, I have no soul, I have no future life, get lost, I'm not going to be worried about you and I'm going to find out if there are moons, you know, what's on the moon of Jupiter. You know? I'm going to look into find out what, the, what, the, what my microbiome is doing. I'm going to like do this and do that. You know, I'm Galileo, I saw a shadow in the, in the pockmarked thing of the moon so I realized that light is shining on the moon, it doesn't shine. You know, I saw that. And I think he saw a shadow, he saw something about Venus, he saw something about Venus too. And which he's not supposed to have seen. So, in other words, the, the materialism liberated these people. And we did all these weird things, but we went overboard and we're now wrecking the planet. How many of you all marched on Sunday, by the way? Oh, you're so good. Good for you. I was coming. I didn't even got the t-shirt. I was, but then I was barred by certain authorities in my household. <laughs> because I had taught two days in a row, five and a half hours a day, and I was exhausted. So I was not allowed to drive down two and a half hours. I would have burned more gas and put out more carbon. So I was completely disbarred from doing that, which I was very frustrated. I felt very, I do feel very guilty, so thank goodness you all went. Thank you so much. But actually I heard it was a lot of people, 400,000, right? It's really great. Maybe more, probably. Right. Yeah, I think pretty much everybody, worldwide too, right? 126 countries they were saying, something like that. And, but they're still minking around in, in, uh, in the UN, but hopefully they'll come up with something. Okay, so that's, th so here he praises, in other words, Vinyanavadin, you know. All systems verified by validating cognition. You know, like a sensible relative reality, even though it's illusory, it can, still there's true and false within the illusion. There's relative true and false within the relative illusion. And there's better, theory, better hypotheses and worse hypotheses, and that's important, right? Hence, the elucidation of intention, differentiation of internal definitions still appears to be an extremely skillful technique. Finally, as that sutra is explained to be teaching according to its disciples, we can understand the teachings that agree with it as the same. Thus, we can understand how Asanga, the author of the treatise, is elucidating its intention, explains also according to the inclinations of his disciples, and does not accept the meaning he explains as his own personal interpretation. Because Asanga writes one book where he's more like a critical relativist, which you see relativist in, in Western philosophy is, is this equal to nihilist. Because West has been so absolutist, either religious theological West or materialist, which is the new theology, you know. In my university, the high inquisition and the, the high lords are the natural sciences. And that's the inquisition. And somebody says that challenges that they're like excommunicated. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna 
I'm going to have a reverse Scopes trial in the middle of the Lowell Library. One that's one of my ambition before I retire. Have them all attack me. How dare you be a Columbia professor and argue that it's a scientific fact that there's former and future life. That's a heresy. Don't you know that? I'm waiting. <laughs> the celebration of that fact is the essential import of all sutra. The master praised the Lord in many treatises from the point of view of his declaration of relativity, having seen this very declaration to be the equivalence in meaning of emptiness by intrinsic reality and relativity to be of the highest. Oh, yeah, I was saying relativism. So they've been so absolutist that they think relativism means there's sort of nothing, there's no truth. It's like nihilism. But that's not correct. There is a word nihilism. And then there's absolutism. You know, there's an absolute dogma, you know, you know, theistic kind of absolutism or whatever it could be, you know, communist absolutism, market absolutism, you know, there can be a fanatic thing about anything, right? But the specific one that nothing is real and the ultimate nature of everything is nothingness, that's nihilism. And that means all things are really meaningless, all things are just accidental, there's no final meaning to anything, you'll never get anywhere with it, and there's no point to it. So live it up and have another Miller. You know, go to the football game, whatever. You know. Just, you know, lock your door, that's all. You know, shoot somebody, get a gun. You know, because it doesn't matter. You just want to defend your pleasure. And uh, that, unfortunately, is our, is our, that's, that, that's our swing song. But relativism is not that. Relativism means that relatively it's better to be kind and gentle and happy than it is to be vicious and nasty and mean and unhappy, and, and the kind of happiness that a nasty, mean person has is really too fragile, and it's never satisfied, and it gets more and more nasty. And they really don't enjoy itself. It's like, you know, that's why I have hope even for Putin, because it's so boring to be a dictator. I think that's why we really, and also Xi Jinping. I don't think, I don't know if you get The Economist, but the cover of the latest Economist has many faces of Xi Jinping on the cover. But you know, who wants to be a dictator? What, the latest recent dictators, what have they done? They completely obliterate their conscience with alcohol, and they sit there and they order people to be killed, more or less. And they have some entertainment, they grab some girls and things, but the girls don't even like them, and they don't like them, and it's loveless, whatever, it's just like, you know, they might as well have a rubber doll, and there's no fun to it. Whereas an oligarch might actually have fun. They might collect Picasso, somebody might like them, so Putin has already stolen from Khodorkovsky and everybody, at least, and the Russian people, at least 50 to 100 billion. He has mansions everywhere and so forth, and plenty of bodyguards. And the south of France is waiting. <laughs> what do they need the Ukraine for? I give them a break. You know? So we want to encourage, I want to move, I met this movie maker from Croatia who makes movies in Poland. And I wanted him to make a movie in Russian about a guy with a split personality disorder who in the summers is a oligarch in the south of France and in the winter is a dictator. And then he gets where he hates being a dictator and he sits there and drinking and he has to shoot down people who come into the door. In fact, he's so paranoid about even the people in his office. And then he's having fun and swimming and you know, he's having a great time in the summer. So I did to encourage Putin to get out. <laughs> But I don't know. This whole thing of like we have to have the Cold War all over again, I can't take it. Okay, so by the very reason that origination depends on causes and conditions, things have no intrinsically identifiable reality. It's what? It's oh, well, make the movie for it, please. Are you a movie maker? Make a movie. The boredom of dictatorship. Poor Stalin. They get rid of it. Now it's so hopeless. Now what? Toward the end, when he was like, you know, and then they try to hide, you know, the, the people around him using his power and try to hide reality from him because he would probably freak out if he realized what he was really doing. I mean, it's really terrible. Anyway, okay. Things have no, that's, I told you that verse, right? Do you remember the verse from the Samadhi Raja Sutra, the King of Samadhi Sutra? The verse is, who understands cause and effect will understand emptiness. Who understands emptiness will develop the most minute mindfulness, or mindfulness of the most minute things. 
I just love that verse. Because it completely undercuts, it's a sutra verse too, it completely undercuts this idea that understanding emptiness is a disappearing from everything. It's a grand departure. The understanding of emptiness is becoming aware that every little thing has a causal efficacy and the and tiny bit better is infinitely better than tiny bit worse. So it makes you really careful, really considerate, really concerned. It's such a great verse. I really like it. The Master salutes the Buddha for the followers of wisdom. I praise. So anyway, we should, we should rehabilitate relativism, critical relativism, as the best philosophy where it's anti-dogmatic, but it completely refuses nihilism. And it realizes that truth, relative truth is always relative and perspectival and contextual. So it's not fanatic and dogmatic about it. And yet there is relative truth and falsehood. So it's clearly, it keeps critical and it wants to improve the relative situation for others and so forth. It's altruistic. And, and it's not nihilism and it's not absolutism. And that's, that's really good. That's what we want. We want relational, connected, relativistic philosophy. I praise the perfect Buddha, the supreme philosopher who taught us relativity, free of cessation and creation without annihilation and permanence with no coming and no going, not a unity or a plurality which is the quiescence of mental fabrications and the supreme bliss. I salute Shakyamuni, another book of Nagarjuna's, I salute Shakyamuni, the herald of relativity, by which law, creations, and cessations are abandoned. And then another one from his rebuttal of objections, I salute that incomparable perfect Buddha who made the declaration of the equivalence of meaning of emptiness, relativity, and the central way, who declared the equivalence of meaning of emptiness, relativity, and the central way. And from the inconceivable praise, praise of inconceivability, I salute the incomparable one whose wisdom was matchless and inconceivable and who declared the realitylessness of interdependently originated things. That's so good. Those are all Nagarjuna's things. And how people could understand Nagarjuna as a nihilist and so on is so sad. Even in India, not just the West. The Vedanta people did. What? Kant. Who? Kant? Kant? Immanuel Kant didn't know Nagarjuna. He what? You, you, what, who, what? No, 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 Kant did, no, no. Well, he said, well, you know, never say never. Not that I have ever heard of anybody who ever studied Kant or, and I didn't read all of his private papers and something like this. And you know, there were people like the great Russian Shabatsky who taught Buddhist logic very much in terms of Kant and seems to have been really well read in all of Kant. And uh, he never said that. You know, he finds that, but of course he wouldn't say that. He lived in the late 19th, early 20th century. He was really the best Buddhist study scholar of that era in Moscow and Petersburg, as the Russians were ahead of the Germans and the English way ahead of them in those studies. But because they had Mongolians, you know, who had the Tibetan thing, you know, where the Indian scientific Buddhist tradition still lived, you know, which it didn't necessarily in other countries to that extent. And, um, I'm sure he would have said so if that was the case, because he presents Kant as pretty more or less the incarnation, not of uh, Nagarjuna, but of Dharmakirti, because of um, the whole Ding an sich idea and something called Salakshana and, and, and the Buddhist logicians. And his great book, Shabatsi, called Buddhist Logic, if you like Kant, if you read his two volume Buddhist Logic, you'll flip out, you really will, where he brings Kant and, and the logicians together. But then Shabatsky does write a book on Nagarjuna on the middle way at Madhyamaka also, it's called the conception of, of uh, uh, Buddhist, you know, something like that. But he's so influenced by his Vedantic Indian Sanskrit teachers that he conflates it with Vedanta. And he makes it, it into a kind of skeptical absolutism or something. He doesn't quite get it. It's not as good, that work. He didn't have, he didn't have the, this kind of, he didn't know this work, this level of work. So, uh, okay, where are we? We have a few minutes. So, chapter four, you know, I, I wanted to finish today chapter three, and then I think we don't meet, I believe, for uh, today's the 24th. Yeah, we don't meet until the 10th, if anybody's still going on for the whole, if anybody will have the <laughs> stamina. Uh, I do. I hope I will again by the 10th. We meet on Friday evening and a Saturday workshop where we'll try to meditate. And that, then we will get to Chandrakirti, 
the great follower of Nagarjuna in chapters 4, 5, and especially in chapter 5 and 7. We touch only lightly on chapter 4, and then we come to, to uh, Chandrakirti's chapter 5 and 7, which are the two great, uh, really greatest uh, dialectical chapters. And uh, 4 uh, only prepares the way for them, the, the, what are called the, I call them the dogmatists. Other people just use the Sanskrit word, the Svatantrika. And, um, and that's what we will do Friday night. We will do the Swatantrikas, and then Saturday we will meditate on the dialecticists. The, uh, and why do I call it dialecticist? Nobody else likes that. And why would I create such a barbarous neologism? You'd think I would have said dogmatical and dialectical. And actually, people will quote my work, and they'll miswrite it, and they'll write dialectical. Nobody likes centrism, either. They don't like centrism. They, they, and they don't want to say middleism, so they say middle wayism or madhyamaka. They just say Sanskrit word, you know. But madhyamaka just means the centrist, you know. And I don't like dialectical and dogmatical because that would mean that they were at this sort of lower level of just sort of a realistic dialectic. Because they use dialectics and they are dogmatic, you know, fanatics at, at all levels. So they're not, it's not the 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 Svatantrika madhyamakas are way sophisticated about selflessness and emptiness. They're awesome yogis and writers. Incredible that Baba Viveka guy was an amazing writer. And so uh, the dogmaticist and dialecticist, putting it like that means it's like that. You know, they're like dialecticists. They're like dogmats, but they're not quite that. So people will really like that posthumously after I die. I think someone will dig it up and they'll like it later. But now they're just angry, like, how can he say that dialecticist? <laughs> what does that mean? It means not using dialectics, but not really stuck in them, but preferring dialectics. Because dialectic means what? Dialogue. Dialectical means that you're dialoguing with somebody, and you're saying what you're saying in regard to what they think, it's like Socratic type of method. So. So that's the thing. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? We have a couple of minutes. Oh, okay. I see you taking it, inhaling. Are you going to say something? <laughs> no? Oh, you have your hand up back there? Oh, you're scratching. Oh, God. Silence. The silence, is this the silence of the sages or the silence of the Sariputra? <laughs> Which? I'll have a question. Yeah. I'm, I'm a bag of bones in, in life, and you were talking about... Find a what? I'm sorry? A bag of bones that is in life. Yeah. What, is that what you are, you say? I think we all are. And oh, yes. Okay. To be also what would you think Who, who's imagining that? Well, I think we all are. Maybe you are not. I am not. I no. I not, not only not imagining that I'm enlightened. I know I'm not. I'm just saying that because then you would say that we all are also of one. Okay. But so what would you say? I'm curious about this individual enlightened soul that is also in all. What would I say about it? Well, what we could call well, first of all, Buddhism is famous for saying no soul. You know, soullessness, selflessness, all this kind of thing. So on the ultimate level, all these things are rejected. But on the relative level, what the Buddhists would call soul, which Buddha was a little coy about, because he, people are so self-centered, and they're so rich with the great problem for people in Buddha's, Buddha's world, in, based on his psychological insight, the great problem with ordinary human beings is they're all psychotic. <laughs> And what that means is they think they're something that they aren't, which means that everyone thinks they have like a point of them or their real self that is always just themselves. It never changes. It's like a, it, it's, it's not a continuity because it doesn't change, but it's always there. And yet, if they ever turn to look for it, they never can find it. But they still, uh, everything they do about life is that, that, that it's really there. That, that, that it never changes. It's like, and most philosophies and religions, like immortal soul, is always going to be you, right? If the church will put you up with God or the synagogue or the mosque, you know, 
to be up with Allah or with Jehovah, Yahweh. And you'll always be up there if you're connected to the right church. And it'll still be just you. Right? So this, by talking soul, Buddha would be giving people encouragement to continue in their psychosis, that they are something that they are not. Whereas what everybody is is a completely bunch of relational process at the coarse bag of bones level and the super subtle soul level. So he was a little coy about talking about soul. But here's what it is. If you look, if you want to see this in more extension, you can look at my introduction to my translation of the Book of the Dead. I give it quite thoroughly because, of course, it involves, soul involves, what is it that takes rebirth, what is it that dies, you know, how does it leave the body, how does it enter a body, all this kind of thing. And uh, with there's, we call there's a, the body-mind complex has coarse, you know, O-A, I mean, C-A-O-R-S-E, is it? No, how do you say, coarse. C O C O A. No, co no, course is C O U. This but there's a C C O A. Yeah, C O A, course. It has a course or gross level, that's the bag of bones. It has and it is the con sense consciousnesses that look out from the bag of bones and hear out from them and feel touch in the five senses. The there's a subtle level, which is like a central nervous system and some deep states of mind related to sleep and wake, but at a deep level. And then there's what's called the super subtle body and mind, actually. Both body, too, and mind. And uh, the super subtle one is like a sort of body is sort of like DNA molecule. And mind is sort of a changeable DNA molecule, not that anything's fixed. And mind is uh, what they call the awareness of clear light. A kind of very, very subtle mind that is aware of, sort of the deepest nature of non-atomic, transatomic reality, something like that. And we all, which we all have, they say. And that level is the level that carries what they call the soul gene, which is the third gene at conception of a, of a being, a being who's born in a womb, that is, where you have egg of father and mother, and then you have this blue drop energy pattern that carries at the, at the level more subtle than a gross atomic molecule, so more subtle than physical DNA. It comes, even some argue it's non-atomic. It's like pure wave, or even it's not necessarily even wave, it's just like something. <laughs> I don't know what, how to describe it. <clears throat> but that is the mind that goes with very subtle energy. And you know, like when you, and the analogy they always use is like when you fall asleep, and first you become completely unconscious, and thank heavens, and we get like, we pass out. But then we may have a dream. And in the dream, we go around and we say things sometimes, we hear things, we tell, we, we see things, mainly see. But sometimes we smell or taste and touch, sometimes, rarely. So we reproduce the five senses, and normally also in a dream, we don't reflect or ever look back at what we are in the dream. What, what is our body? But when we remember a dream, it's like, oh, I was there in the dream. So we're sort of assuming that we had we were similar, like a virtual replica of our coarse body in the subtle plane of the dream. And then people come up with theory, oh, it's all happening in your brain, you're the materialist too, it's just like the brain is doing something. But from the Buddhist point of view, that is a rehearsal for what it's like to be in the subtle body where the image of yourself is just reproducing some coarse image. And it's very changeable because it's just like a mental, like a dream image, it's just a mental image. And that's not the same thing as the soul transition between death and rebirth, but it's a, it's a good analogy for it. So that's where the soul goes, but the soul is not a fixed thing. It's completely changeable. It's like a continuum process. And therefore, the, in the Buddhist psychological world, the, the Buddhist who gains the science, you know, who gains what they call the mind science or the inner science of Buddhism, who really has a sense of that realistic worldview, they're very nervous about dying with their unconscious still unconscious. And so their the whole meditative, you know, career in life, and ideally all the, their main thing they do is study, learn, and meditate, and critically reflect. You know, if they're a mendicant, that's what a mendicant is, it's like a person on tenure. In a Buddhist society, 
well, at whatever level of education they are, people take care of them because they feel they're doing the most important thing humans can do, which is become conscious of their evolution, as well as be nice in life and not harmful. And uh, they want to become completely conscious of all of their inner process at the subtle, super subtle and coarse level. So that's sort of what it is, you know. And uh, the mechanism is explained in the Book of the Dead thing. And, but but it's in the Book of the Dead, it has all kind of thing about different Tibetan deities. All this. So if you read my introduction, though, you'll get a sense of what they're talking about, of that book. OK? All right. It's online. You can get it for two bucks. You know, I don't get it. Penny, you know, never mind. I'm not just selling it. It is really useful. It is. It's better than the other translation. I'm sorry. It is. It's not perfect, though. I would, I would improve it if I redid it now. Yes? So, like, is there a kind of follow up question to that? Yes. So the body as matter, right? The body of our own will disintegrate and become many things. Like sure. Kind of Worm food. Tree, right, whatever. Calcium. Food. Why wouldn't it? Well, well, okay, but look, you, your mind now, you have a mind now, right? Yes. And you're very much holding on to your body not to disperse, very much. And you're not comfortable in a dispersed condition. <laughs> if you've ever been really drunk or stoned or something, you might have been nervous <laughs> after the first after the first euphoria passed and you're worried about the traffic and the people and whatever, right? And so why do you think when the body, when the body disperses that you wouldn't want to be continuing your sense of yourself and you want to defend yourself against what you consider to be not yourself, which is other things? Like in a dream, in a dream the body is just resting. The cells are not, you know, the senses are not functioning and yet you manufacture a sense of senses. You see things, you hear things. How come you're bothering to do that in the dream? You know, why aren't you just happily passed out? Because you're used to being, you know, your sense of control and security, et cetera, is yourself within your skin as a separate entity maneuvering and navigating to remain in good circumstances. So the body, that body goes and actually you are lamenting this, the seeming stability you had in that body. Even people who are in quite a bit of pain in their older, much older age, much older than you, you are still fine. I can testify to two more aches. And, and I'll be worse, I'm sure, eventually. And so, but even then, unless they are deluded by some promise of some fake scientists that they can count on an anesthetic dispersed state by just destroying the body, will not eagerly get rid of their body, even if it's bothering them. And even, even when they start, even if they, I know some people maybe called Jack to work in or the equivalent and then said, no, no, I think not, maybe tomorrow, right? So the point is, if you could, uh, if you could identify with being dispersed and unified with the universe, then disperse away. But the point is, that's not your habit. And you feel very insecure, dispersed amongst people, because you, you, you have a picture of a lot of unpleasant circumstances in the world. So you don't want necessarily to disperse amongst all of them. So that's the thing. In a way, you could say what a Buddha is, is a being that has anticipated this dispersion and who has like been willing to embrace all the negative and the positive by seeing sort of in a way that it's kind of ultimately inevitable and that in a way, at a deep level, he is everything, or she is everything, or it is whatever Buddha is. It's everything. And then on that basis, uh, a Buddha can then manifest all sorts of things from that dispersed direction, because they, by totally dispersing, what they discover is that there is no nothing, and that actually there's this abundant base of energy, what they call the clear light of the void, the transparency of the void, which is like an infinite calm because it's infinite energy, but which yet can be drawn on infinitely. And unfortunately, ignorant people draw on it to create an impossible situation for themselves where they are separate from all this other stuff that is just impinging on them and they can't fend off forever. And then they go through little dispersions like little deaths and things, and then they reconstruct their sense and they try to battle their way through it. So actually, the ultimate cure for it, of course, ultimate cure is 
to disperse while alive and then realize that that's all right. And then the way one, one is individuated becomes a conscious act where creative act where one wouldn't, and one wouldn't even bother except that it, to reach out to some other being, you know, who one sees off in a worse state of oneself by people you love. You know, you don't really want to abandon them. Really you freaked out. I mean, you, you feel maybe you have to if you don't discover there's a way of not being freaked out. But if one had an experience that is possible to be supremely unfreaked out and even happy and blissful, we would want that for everyone that we love, of course. Right? And we might as well, because we have, we have infinite energy to draw upon. We would discover at that state of utter dispersion, where we thought we might become nothing, maybe even we're longing to become nothing, actually. There might be a deep underneath, deep underlying will to non-existence. It's actually, in Buddhist psychology, there is that. Like there's a grasping existence, there's also a will to non-existence. And uh, that's, that will to non-existence, of course, is, is what the high priests of materialism up in my university and all these departments of natural science will ravaging away with all the funding and all the corporate, you know, because they're going to invent more things, the military invent more bombs and more poison gases, whatever. And uh, they, they are promising everybody that, you know, that everybody will just disperse. So therefore, it doesn't matter what happens, so don't check up on them too much. You know, in this great book, you know, those of you who march to, since we're in the climate change, like let's get serious sort of mode this week, just to mention, there's a great little book that one woman, a philosopher of science at Harvard with a tech person from Caltech or someplace, a team, they wrote this little book called The Collapse of Western Civilization, which, you know, I don't think it's really Western, but it's materialist civilization, really. They're calling that Western. But what they, and what it is, is it's written with a lot of study, it's not really like a drama, you know, because it's written from like the 22nd century or something, where everything is really messed up, and there have been major cataclysms, and you know, thing, a lot of things are gone, you know, already, and they call our period the penumbral period, where we could have changed it. You know, we're the generations that could have changed the trajectory and didn't, and so they're looking back into the penumbral period from the perspective of someone who's on, you know, they haven't made up a sort of fictional committee or something. And they're looking at what were the causes of this failure. And the one, and there's a bunch of things, but the one of them that I really found really cool that they noticed is that the scientists know, they're the ones who know the facts that we are wrecking the, the base of life for ourselves and everyone. They know, they really, they really do know that. And yet, they won't say they know it in a really firm way. They kind of, well, you know, if we're so and so many percent, this and that. And a lot of them, their funding comes from the people of these, the, you know, those the oil industries worldwide are like, they control everything. They have so much. And we're subsidizing, by the way, $550 billion every year we give to them to find more unburnable fossil fuel reserves, and they look for the, they spend those hundreds of billions to find fossil, some of them, they give themselves stock options, of course, with some of our subsidies, we with our unemployment and with our poverty and all of our things, but they, they also uh, spend it finding more reserves because even though their scientists know that they can't burn that stuff, it raises their stock price, so their stock option becomes more valuable for the individual corporate people. So it's, and they say, and, and you know, you don't think of that because you think, oh yeah, the scientists are protesting and they say, and, and, and the Koch brothers hire some fake scientists and Exxon Mobil does, and the fake scientist is some guy with like a polyester suit and with a little office in Maryland, you know, and he's never had an experiment in his life. And he says, oh yeah, it's just a theory and we don't know yet. And they haul him into Congress and they talk to James Inhofe, who's Oklahoma employee of the Kochs, who goes on and on for hours in the congressional record about how it's the greatest hoax in history climate change, and after all, it destroyed the dinosaurs, and that wasn't ExxonMobil who destroyed the dinosaurs. You know, actually 20 years ago, the dinosaurs were destroyed by an asteroid after the Cold War was over, because we no longer had to have a space missile industry to defend against the Russians. So then they wanted to keep the space missile <laughs> industry 
So something was destroyed by an asteroid that made the planet dark for like uh, 10 years and all the dinosaurs died. And then they had Bruce Willis up there saving us from the asteroid. <laughs> Did you see that with the auto nuclear weapons and whatever? Dear Bruce. But now the, the dinosaurs were destroyed by global warming <coughs> without the Koch brothers' industry. So it's not their fault now. It's just a natural thing. And he even gives, he gives money to the Smithsonian and they make studies of the dinosaur extinction. And it's planning, they're really smart in propaganda. Anyway, what it, so they don't really, all of them get up there and say corporate sponsor of our department and on my latest grant or corporate controller of the Congress who controls the government money that goes into my drug, my grant, my this, my that. We're telling you you're destroying the earth. We all say this without change. And that's, we get up and say that all the time on all television. And the three guys say, not well, that'd be good. Let's listen to them. But we have the thousands of us speak out. They don't do it. And they, and they look back, this person from Harvard, History of Science, and they say, why didn't they do that? How come? And I was thinking about it today. And you know, of course, they're on the payroll. They're supporting all the institutions, this corporate thing. Totally. The just the Congress are about lapdogs. They are should be fired, all of them. They are not even observing their oath of office at all. And the, the poor guy, I mean, I feel badly for them. 538 of them, and there's 55,000 lobbyists down on K Street and M Street and L Street and whatever, if you've been there, and they are paid three, four, five times the amount that Congress people are, and they have much better staff and more information computer, and they write all the legislation, and they just hand it to them and say, you do this or I'm not going to give you this. Paltry 100,000 that I give you, and I make 50 billion. I mean, it's really crazy. They sell themselves so cheap, even. Why don't they charge more money to Congress? <laughs> I know this is off the topic. <laughs> but we passed, it's, it's, it's because I'm guilty I didn't march. <laughs> and we also passed the, uh, I wasn't allowed to, and we passed the uh, time and told over the class. Thank you very much. Take it easy, bag of bones. There's a new guy on the block here. Very good. <laughs> Tom, I love that document. Can we make? Can you email it to me so I can email it to those people and see if that would satisfy them? Thank you very much for completing that. Oh, okay. Okay. Add a few more bills and whistles. Thank you. Okay. Sure, and then I'll sell it, send it to them and say, look, is this cool with you? Can we now finally say we're affiliated with you? Right. And you're affiliated with us. Right. Hey, cool, and if they want more things, they do it. Hey, hey Raymond, hello, how are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank Great you for that time. lovely dinner. You're welcome. You know, you're welcome. I went to the, I went and bought the Saves Nunez cooking one night. I went and bought a shepherd's pie, one of the little ones. Yeah. But it, yours was so much better. I think the, oh. they put more veggies in the big one. Maybe, yeah. Ours was mostly potatoes, the little one. Oh, that's <laughs> Well, I love that so much and love meeting Ed and, and yeah. uh, what's her name? Miriam. What? Miriam. They're yeah. such a great couple. Yeah, lovely. Is yeah. she still sleepless? Kind of, yes. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, good. She watches too much TV. <laughs> She's a news junkie. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, well, that's her yoga. I know. That's okay. What do you think? Oh, by the way, this is Michael Esben. Remember I showed you the sculptures? This is him, Michael Esben. I gave him a couple of those little postcards just to show what you do. What? Well, he, because he knows the art world really well. I thought he'd have some ideas, but maybe he will. But no rush. I mean, maybe a rush. But. Okay, good. Okay, man. So, yeah. Take it easy. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Yeah. Did they have you as my guest? I hope. No, no, no. Don't be oh, so. Why not? Because I like to support the. Uh, oh, well, thanks. Thank you. Take care. Uh, Let me tell you something. For me, what? For me, this evening, this discussion yes. was the best of the three. The me? Which me? For myself. This yes. Me. Oh I yeah. Me? Yeah. Your discussion this evening was oh. the most interesting. Oh good. Oh, well, I'm glad we're not collapsing. <laughs> so, I want to 
ask a small, tiny favor yes. of you, if yes. it's What's possible. That? Very quickly. I prepared a little plastic folder of okay. sculpture. It's I know, you know, stones. the problem is that people hand the Halama stuff all the time. And, you know, and just hand it off, you know. It might be a waste of effort. I don't you know, if, if I had it, but I can try, but I'm just warning you, because he I gets no handed so many things. Okay. Like you said. Okay, okay. And I appreciate it. Okay, can sure. I this with you? I feel, uh, you have a there. Very good. Of course, my protector, <laughs> one of them. No, Yamantika doesn't actually protect. Yamantika is it. the mind of voidness, you know, that confronts death. Well. And then saves you, saves death from, you know, saves death from death. <laughs> and eternal life. But, you know, with, which is the death of death. Right? Well. But he doesn't, he doesn't function like what they call a protector. I didn't mean it quite in that way. No, I, I know. Thank I you know. for the clarification. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sí, ¿cómo estás usted? Bien, bien. 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 Gracias, gracias. Gracias. How are you? Hi, fine, I'm good. How are you? Good. So, good. William, I have another four jumps for you. <laughs> you want to come see? Hello, Xiaoming. Xiaoming, I have two painters I'm, I meant to I just haven't gotten around to writing you. Okay. Two painters. Okay. Oh, you know, you know Rabkar. I do know. I know. The He's tremendous. I told you about him. And then, I, I and then there's uh, there. Oh yeah. Wait, hey Michael. Yeah. Where is Michael? Oh, I want.